The people who saw the money were the MD government. They are there, they are still alive. Mr. Chikwanda is alive. Uh, Idris Nawaku is alive. They are all there. Me, I was 29, 30 years old. I've said this before. No, but Mwa was 29, 30 years old. Arishama Maini, which belongs to the government. Mwa Mwa Arikwi, Mwa Arishipula. Mwa Arikwi, Mwa Arikwi, Mwa Arikwi, Mwa Arishipula. Beneath the ground are the largest copper reserves in Africa, an essential commodity in the global economy. Glengo, and the Glengo, yes. Today, virtually all Sambian copper mines are owned by multinational corporations. In 10 years, they've extracted copper worth more than 29 billion US dollars. As a country, as a nation, God has blessed us with such an abundant natural resource. Now, the paradox is that Zambia is ranked among the bottom 20 in terms of poverty, 20 poorest countries. We are wealthy, yet we are poor. The problem is no longer so much one of absolute poverty. It's become one of inequality, and Zambia is really a case in point for this. A lot of people think that we in the West have been extremely generous in the amount of foreign aid that we provide uh, to the developing countries and particularly to Africa. Globally, our estimate is that the amount of money flowing out of developing countries is 10 times the amount of foreign aid flowing into developing countries. I've come to Zambia to find out why this country, with its enormous wealth of natural resources, is still among the poorest in the world. Why the boom in copper prices has not reduced poverty. The same question many Zambians ask themselves in the latest election. He's the Vice President. Mr. Speaker. In October 2011, Guy Scott, who once threatened to march on the copper plants if they didn't pay their taxes, became vice president. We're aware that Africa is losing more money from tax avoidance by foreign companies every year than it's gaining from aid from the countries from which these people come. God, he gave copper to Zambia. And these people, if they don't respect the Zambian soil where there is copper, mining or any other business venture in Zambia, they should contribute. These, these mining industries, they export and we don't know where they are, what they are doing with our money. If they are exporting our minerals, the money must come back to Zambia. So the current uh, investors should wake up stand up and be counted and they should not wait for the government to push them. We don't have time pushing people. Vice President Guy Scott was born in Zambia. He studied economics at Cambridge and holds a PhD in cognitive science. It seems peculiar that you're vice president in Zambia and you're white. Well, uh, white vice presidents occur from place to place, like the United States of America has got one. And uh, I don't think in the Caribbean it would be all that unusual. It's just a thing that's a bit unusual in Africa. But Africa's maybe changing. I mean, I'm a, I'm a Zambian nationalist. Why not? What else would I be? Well, uh, a, a colonial farmer exploiting is something. No, no, I think a colonial farmers don't have any votes anyway, even if I wanted to stand on their ticket. And there are very few farmers here, white farmers. No, but you understand the question, I guess. I mean, it is, it is uh, from, from... Yeah, normally a white politician in an African country will be representing white minority interests. That's not the case here. I'm regarded as pro-poor, pro, pro-unemployed, pro, pro the ordinary people of the, of the earth. This is the London Metal Exchange, where the world market price on copper is determined. 
between 2001 and 2008, the price on copper nearly quadrupled. Yet, despite the boom, the foreign investors paid virtually nothing in profit tax in Zambia. One reason could be transfer pricing. Transfer pricing is uh, an enormously damaging um, phenomenon right the way across Africa. The name of the game is to shift your profits out of the high tax countries, the onshore countries such as in Africa, where the profits are actually being made, and shift them artificially into low tax countries, into tax havens, uh, where they won't be taxed or won't be taxed properly. The way that this, this is done is uh, by multinational groups is that they have subsidiaries all around the world and these subsidiaries trade with each other and they can artificially manipulate the prices of these trades for bookkeeping purposes, for accounting purposes. The tax haven subsidiary will buy something cheaply and sell it on much more expensively and between that gap there's a huge profit uh, and, but they won't be taxed in the tax haven. <laughs> Much Zambian copper is not traded on the open market, but bought and sold internally within the same multinational corporations. On paper, this makes Switzerland one of the biggest importers of Zambian copper. Switzerland is a huge purchaser of copper out of Zambia, but that doesn't mean that the copper is shipped from Zambia to Switzerland. The documentation goes to Switzerland, but the copper goes all over uh, the world. The Zambian copper mines were privatized and sold to foreign investors in 2000. It is fair to say that of all the frauds that occurred in Zambia during President Chaluba's time, the privatization of ZCCM was one of the uh, most significant. The privatization process has never been officially investigated for corruption, but the president at the time, Frederick Chiluba, was sued by the Zambian state for misappropriation of funds in the London High Court in 2007. Michael Sullivan represented Zambia in the case against Chiluba. President Chiluba was found liable in damages uh, to the Republic of Zambia uh, in the sum of $46 million for uh, conspiracy to defraud at the Republic and for breach of fiduciary duty. A very living example concerns the purchase of extravagant shoes and suits from, in particular, one named Boutique Basile in Geneva. There was spent over $1.1 million and the uh, clothes which were purchased uh, were found during uh, the investigation into state corruption. I've seen them myself. There were 11 trunks. I mean, I have the uh, list of what was um, uh, found in the, the trunks and you have um, 206 designer suits, 185 shirts, 36 jackets, 157 trousers, and 64 pairs of shoes, uh, and 74 ties. Now, all these ties were designer ties, mainly coming from Switzerland and Italy. So um, there you have a, a, a graphic example of um, the um, nature and extent of, of the corruption. Said CCM was sold for a total of 627 million US dollars. Last year alone, the mines produced copper worth more than 6 billion US dollars. President Chaluba died in 2011. Francis Kaunda, who headed the negotiations, still lives in Zambia. In 2008, he was sentenced to two years in prison for corruption relating to the privatization of said CCM. For half a year, I tried to get an interview. So, so you, you, you would want a payment for the interview? Yes, I would charge for it. When I declined to pay, our communication ended. Forget it. I just want you to have the opportunity because we talked... Forget it. You don't, you don't quite know what you can, can I please say something? Uh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, I, I would Forget just... Forget it. Oh, sorry. 
Okay. Any right-thinking Zambian, anybody, could see that what was being agreed was not transparent. Information is very important, and knowledge based on information is very important. The state represented by very bribed, ignorant politicians at the very top eh, could not legitimately act as negotiators for Zambia. From the outset, the investors had the upper hand in the sales negotiations. Copper prices had hit rock bottom and the state was running out of money. Its debt to the World Bank and the IMF was so large they could not get new loans. Zambia had its back against the wall and was forced to sell. The executive board were more and more nervous about that. So uh, uh, the board let me with no initiative but to get the money back and not to extend more credit to that country if we are not repaid or if we don't invent a scheme to be repaid. The mines was the last great resource that the state held uh, and the bank and fund were very keen uh, for, that, for the mines to be privatized. And so they made it a condition of a series of loans to Zambia uh, and a series of debt relief initiatives that the mines be privatized. Hello once again and welcome to privatization. Government appears to be committed. We will ensure as government that not only do we keep the promises, but we work as responsibly as possible to ensure that we succeed. So the IMF acted as a, uh, effectively a gatekeeper to all donors, both the bank, the fund, and all bilateral donors. We were basically under the, the, the instructions of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. The IMF has itself has never imposed a privatization, uh, possibly in some very limited cases, but not in the case of Zambia. But what, uh, what occurred frequently is that governments have said to their public opinion, we are privatizing because the World Bank and the IMF tell us that uh, if we don't do that, they will not finance us. But it is not correct, or it is only partially correct. Uh, uh, but it's part of the rhetoric, it's part of the, of the, for the governments of, uh, let's say, saving their face. Um, effectively, Zambia made a decision that the country was in such a desperate situation with its very high debt that it should do anything it could to please the foreigners. Uh, anything you need to do to keep the donors engaged um, and to an extent to attract investors should be done. These were very, very painful moments because we were not given the opportunity to get the correct value of our assets. If you want to have foreign investors, well, you should treat them properly uh, and not to be, let's say, more uh, demanding on them than the neighboring countries. If not, they will go to, to the neighboring countries. Here, a degree of wisdom is needed in the management of the countries. Today, the privatization of the copper mines, combined with the boom in prices, has revitalized the mining sector. Yet despite economic growth, unemployment remains largely unchanged with more than 64% of the population living below the poverty line, Zambia is more than ever desperate to attract foreign investment, hoping this will create new jobs. Since we came to power, which is only six months ago, something like 150,000 people have been dumped on the jobs market. And we have certainly haven't created 150,000 jobs in the six months that we've been in power. Yes. For the investment okay. park. Is that right? Today? Yes, Your More than for the mine. That's what I just clarified. I'm sorry about the Minister of Commerce. I couldn't track him down. Every speech, every, every pamphlet, every newspaper story talks about we owe the youth jobs. Unemployment, unemployment, unemployment. And you, you just can't escape it. And even the opposition now, the ones who were in government for 20 years, are now trying to tell us that we have failed because we haven't managed to create 
million jobs or whatever it is. The foreign, foreign mining companies go a certain way towards that, and they'd go a lot further if they paid their tax. Mind you, you read my lips, I didn't say they're not paying tax. But if they pay, if they were to pay more tax, they do go a very long way to indirectly creating jobs. Through our investment, we also want to, to make our due contributions to the deepening of friendship between China and Zambia. And we also want to see the friendship between the people of the two countries can be deepened through our investment because we can understand each other much better through our investment here. Um, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for organizing the lunch. We need Chinese lunch in Zambia more often. Our priorities in Zambia are jobs. Jobs and more jobs and taxation revenue. Because to, to provide decent living for the majority of Zambians, we have to find them something worthwhile to do. And we also have to be able to provide them with social services such as free education to secondary level and to uh, supply them with medical services. But all that takes money. And uh, thank you for coming along to supply the money. So our, uh, our friendship, I believe it's a genuine friendship, but it's, it's based on, on material results. Your Honor, we have a, a small request. Uh, my colleagues want to take a photo with you. We don't know whether it is uh, permitted. <laughs> the first key to development in a country like Zambia, where you've got a serious unemployment problem and it's growing. I mean, I have to give my phone to my secretary every morning and keep it turned off at night because there's so many people wanting jobs and they think, I know, I've somehow got hold of the vice president's phone number and he owes me a job because I once uh, organized a rally for him in some part of the country or or maybe he knows my brother or, or, you know, there's endless people needing jobs. Any old job will do, they're so desperate. You, you, you can tell it, you can smell it, you can feel it. If you, if you keep your phone turned on, you, you hear it, you, you see it on the SMSs. Come in the whole time. I want a job, I want a job, I want a job. Thank you. Thank you. Long life for you. Well, uh, you too. We might as well, <laughs> <laughs> we might as well both enjoy it. <laughs> The lack of tax revenue from the mines has left some donor countries concerned that Zambia is not benefiting enough from its copper. At the Norwegian embassy, economists have scrutinized the numbers. Nous avions les chiffres de 2006. Alors, la valeur de l'exportation était de 3 milliards de dollars et les revenus de, de la Zambie étaient de 50 millions de dollars. Et encore faut-il tenir compte du fait qu'il y a des contrats de fourniture d'électricité qui coûtent au gouvernement zambien 150 millions de dollars. Donc, ils étaient en perte. A World Bank report from 2011 states that Zambia is losing money on the production of electricity and that the rates paid only capture 40% of historic costs. According to the mining companies, there's a simple explanation to why they've hardly paid any profit tax. What am I saying? What I'm saying is that a number of companies had carry over tax losses. That's one. Then two, because the productive infrastructure had deteriorated, dilapidated so badly, it required huge investment to bring the production up. The production now is over 700, but over $5 billion has been, in, 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 has, has been injected, has been invested in plant rehabilitations, plant expansions, and new facilities. According to the Norwegian findings, Zambia was hardly benefiting from the extraction of copper. In 2007, the tax revenue from the mining sector amounted to only 0.2% of the gross national product, while at the same time, 
Copper made up nearly 71% of Zambia's exports. En regardant ces contrats, nous nous sommes aperçus des graves anomalies. Je suis allé à Lusaka, je suis allé devant l'Assemblée nationale pour dire c'est votre affaire, mais si vous le demandez, si vous et votre gouvernement vous le demandez, nous communauté internationale sous leadership norvégien, nous sommes d'accord pour financer euh, les experts. Zambian President Levi Mwanamwasa took the advice and ordered a revision of the sales agreements and the Zambian tax laws. Nous avons lancé un grand concours international pour trouver les meilleurs, les meilleurs lobbyistes et les meilleurs experts fiscaux. Ils ont conclu que les contrats étaient léonins, qui n'avaient pas de valeur, et du coup, ils sont créé un nouveau statut fiscal pour permettre euh, aux Zambiens de bénéficier de l'envol du prix du cuivre. In April 2008, the Zambian government cancelled the conditions in the original sales agreements and introduced a new tax regime.